This is the Air Jordan 1. It's an iconic shoe made by Nike for basketball legend Michael Jordan. It's a piece of footwear history. If you're into sneakers at all, then you've probably either owned or wanted a pair of these. Maybe they're even your grills. But did you know that the Air Jordan 1 was once banned by the NBA? Or was it really? The year is 1983 and Michael Jordan is a young college basketball star playing for the University of North Carolina. A promising athlete, MJ would be drafted to the NBA the following year at the 1984 NBA draft as the third overall pick by the Chicago Bulls. Meanwhile, the sportswear company Nike was still a young player in the basketball shoe market. Struggling to keep up with Adidas and Converse, Nike needed to make a bold move fast if they wanted to keep up with their competitors. In 1984, Nike had some great players like Moses Malone and Jamal Wilkes, but they didn't have a marquee player like other brands did. Converse had a roster of superstars like Larry Bird, Isaiah Thomas, Magic Johnson, and Dr. J. Nike wanted their next endorsee to be the face of Nike basketball, someone who would boost the company's profile on the court and bring fresh eyes to Nike. They had a young rookie in mind, but there was one big problem. Michael Jordan did not want to sign with them. In fact, he was 100% reluctant. You have to understand that in 1984, Michael Jordan was just a 19 to 20 year old kid. And like most kids at the time, Michael was into Adidas. The flashy track suits and three stripes were appealing to young Mike, and he didn't want anything to do with an unestablished brand called Nike. Adidas was not interested in Jordan, and since Jordan was so determined to not go with Nike, he decided to take the meeting with his next best option, Converse. But even Converse didn't meet the standards that MJ had in his head. His dream was to get a shoe deal with Adidas, and that was that. Michael had no interest in going with Nike. He wanted to go with Adidas. That was who he was strong preference and he didn't even want to get on the plane to see Nike and I said well, Michael you know we're going to visit all the companies it's like getting recruited by colleges and you have to see the people and see the facilities and whatever he said David honestly you know I played a long season just finished the Olympics with coach Knight it was grueling I don't want to go and I, no, I didn't know him very well I only met him twice we had no relationship we barely knew each other and I'm making my very first recommendation of my career, and he's basically turning me down. Before even playing a single game, Nike went all in on Michael Jordan. As you can imagine, Nike rushed to create the perfect shoe for the newly signed rookie. Nike's creative director at the time was Peter Moore, the same guy who designed the Nike Dunk. Moore was assigned the task of designing Michael's very first Air Jordan model. A very tricky task because Michael Jordan didn't even like Nike shoes to begin with. He told Peter Moore he didn't like how Nike soles were always so high and that he needed to be able to feel closer to the floor when he played in his shoes. MJ wasn't exactly a fan of Air technology. After several meetings with Michael Jordan, Peter Moore got to work on the design. He figured out a way to lower the air unit and use a black and red colorway pattern to match MJ's Chicago Bulls jersey. The shoe was similar in design to older Nike classics like the Air Force One and the Nike Dunk. The iconic name for the brand, Air Jordan, was sought up in mere minutes by David Falk and Rob Strasser. Here's a clip of David Falk talking about how they came up with the name Air Jordan. So what do I want to call it? I want to call it Michael Jordan. Like, what, what else are you going to call it if it's a signature line? It's his signature shoe. And he said, David, you don't understand. The last two or three years in America, we've been inundated with designer products. No one is going to feel as any credibility in a 21-year-old basketball player, rookie, designing shoes. No one's going to think that Michael's sitting in his apartment coming up with ideas to design shoes. He has no expertise in, in design. So we can't call it Michael Jordan. So I said, OK, what do you want to call it? He said, ah, that's your challenge. He said, we will make a line, but you've got to come up with a name for the line, but it can't be Michael Jordan. All of a sudden, it occurred to me that Nike had just come out with a new running shoe that had this alle allegedly revolutionary technology called air soles that cushion your foot. And I'm thinking to myself, air, Michael is a great dunker. He flies through the air. So I said, OK, I, literally, maybe it took me a minute. I got it, so we're gonna call it Air Jordan. The original black and red colorway was groundbreaking. Before the Air Jordan 1, basketball shoes were white silhouettes with minimal color. If there was any color at all, it was used in subtle ways to represent a player's uniform or a player's team. The majority of basketball shoes had a white base, so when the Air Jordan 1 came out, it was bold and loud, 
and probably pissed a lot of people off. The shoe was so different that you had to love it. Fans of the sport finally had a basketball player they loved and could actually dress like off the court. Back in those days, basketball players like Dr. J dressed in suits and high-end designer clothes. And all of a sudden, here's this young basketball player, Michael Jordan, rocking Air Jordan 1s in jeans off the court. It was fresh and new, something no one had ever seen before. He was bigger than basketball, and everybody knew it. Everything was going according to plan until the unthinkable happened. The NBA sent a letter to Nike stating that the shoe's colorway did not comply with the National Basketball Association's uniform rules and procedures. This brought huge attention to Michael Jordan and Nike, but more importantly, it brought tons of attention to the shoe. What happened next was one of the most brilliant marketing moves in history. Nike decided that they would ignore the letter from the NBA and Michael Jordan would still play in the shoe, but it would come at the cost of a $5,000 fine per game. Nike was not only willing to pay the fine, they turned it into the opportunity of a lifetime. On September 15th, Nike created a revolutionary new basketball shoe. On October 18th, the NBA threw them out of the game. Fortunately, the NBA can't stop you from wearing them. Air Jordans from Nike. You can imagine the amount of hype this created for the Air Jordan 1. The NBA can stop Michael Jordan from wearing the shoe, but they can't stop you from wearing them. People went crazy for the shoe. But what a lot of people don't know is there's actually a lot of speculation around whether the shoe was actually banned or not. And not only that, was the shoe in question even the Air Jordan 1? It wasn't. Get this, during Jordan's 1984 rookie season, MJ wore Nike airships. He wore them in white and red, but he also wore them in a special black and red colorway. Nike made a pair of black and red airships that they used as a placeholder for the Air Jordan 1 while it was still being designed, and it was in fact these Nike airships that the NBA so-called banned. So now you know, the Air Jordan 1 wasn't actually banned by the NBA. It was actually the Nike airship. And it was never a, really a ban, it was just a warning from the NBA. But Nike's genius marketing strategy made everyone believe that it was banned and because of that there's a lot of myth around the shoe and a lot of legend and it makes it that much better I think. These are some of the most popular Air Jordan models in the world. You've probably seen them on the feet of kids, NBA stars, celebrities, and even 71 year old dripped out grandpas. These sneakers were carefully designed. Every single little detail considered perfected for the greatest basketball player of all time. And then there's this one shoe, the Black Sheep. You guys already know what Jordan I'm talking about. The Air Jordan 2. This is Bruce Kilgore. Bruce is responsible for the design of one of Nike's most successful silhouettes, the Nike Air Force One. In 1986, Bruce along with Air Jordan 1 designer Peter Moore were tasked with designing the Air Jordan 2. This was not going to be easy since the Air Jordan 1 was a massive success. Following up the Air Jordan 1 was going to need some bold design direction and risk taking. And that's exactly what they did. If you look at the entire line of Jordan shoes, the Jordan 2 stands out like a sore thumb. And there's a reason why. Nike's whole idea for the Air Jordan 2 was to make a luxury basketball shoe. A sneaker that could perform on the court and could also be worn with a tuxedo off it. Something fashionable but still performance based. An interesting observation about the decision to take a luxury approach to the shoe is the fact that at the time, Michael Jordan was into rocking gold chains and into dressing flashy. He even wore gold chains while playing on the court. Maybe they took that into consideration when designing the shoe, but I'm not sure, I could be wrong, it's just something I noticed, but what do you guys think? Leave a comment below. Prototypes for the Air Jordan 2 included a hybrid version that has the Jordan upper, but the Jordan 2 sole. It's very strange to look at, right? It almost gives me anxiety. It looks so weird. They also experimented with another prototype that looked nothing like the final product. A low cut version of this prototype was used for the Chicago Bulls cheerleaders to wear. Bruce Kilgore and Peter Moore finally decided on a design and when it came time to manufacture the shoe, they chose only the most premium of materials to produce the highest quality shoe for their superstar. Upon its release in 1986, the Air Jordan 2 featured genuine Italian leather and a layer of fake iguana skin on the upper to give it a more luxurious and high fashion feel. Oddly enough, 
The shoe didn't feature any kind of swoosh branding. They went with the Air Jordan wing logo on the tongue and the Nike Tex logo on the heel and bottom sole. The sneaker also featured a really cool heel counter for support and a giant airbag in the heel. Staying true to the theme of luxury, Nike made the decision to produce the shoe in Italy. This made the Air Jordan 2 unbelievably expensive, and it retailed at $100 per pair. The Air Jordan 2 released in two original colorways, the white, red, and gray, and the white, red, and black models. The following year, in 1987, they released low-top versions of the shoe, which also featured the same red and white and white and red black colorways. MJ was first spotted wearing the Air Jordan 2 in a commercial which featured him doing his famous Rockabye baby dunk. Entering his third season off a broken foot injury, MJ was ready to prove himself once again as a rising star in the league. Michael Jordan went on to break records that season. He became the second player after Wilt Chamberlain to score 3,000 points a season and averaged 37.1 points per game, which I think by today's standards is still pretty insane. 37.1 points a game, I mean come on. And if that wasn't enough, the same season MJ racked up 100 blocks and 200 steals. Crazy. All of this while wearing the Air Jordan 2 on his feet. Now, the Air Jordan 2 had some notable collabs and has also been retroed several times. In fact, it was one of the first sneakers Nike ever retroed. But hey, if you made it this far into the video, I just wanted to say thank you. I know it may sound disrespectful to call the Air Jordan 2 a failure, but let me elaborate. One could argue that the Air Jordan 2 was quote unquote a failure when you look at the shoe's impact and where it stands in the Jordan line today. And I'm talking about the OG Jordans, like the, the 1 through the 14. The 2 is the most underappreciated and unpopular model. Furthermore, after it came out, Bruce Kilgore and Peter Moore were dismissed from designing for the Jordan line, and it makes you wonder why. In fact, Peter Moore left the company shortly after because he was growing frustrated with designing the Jordan 3, and that's where Tinker Hatfield came in. The Jordan 2 put Nike in a rut. Everyone knows that Michael Jordan signed with Nike as a last resort and just wasn't a fan of the shoe. He hated the Air Jordan 2, despite having an amazing season in them. He thought the shoe was too heavy and he just, he wasn't a fan of Nike. But then again, I mean, you can't really follow up the Air Jordan 1, can you? Personally, I'm not a big fan of the shoe. Being a sneaker enthusiast, I can definitely appreciate the design and the shoe's place in history, but I feel like it's underappreciated for a reason. I do like some of the lows though, especially the University Blue lows. The Don T collabs are nice, but man, look at the Air Jordan 2 and Eminem collabs. These go for thousands, but they're hideous. I will say though that the Bin 23 Jordan 2 is pretty nice. I like that brown. But what do you guys think about the Air Jordan 2? I get the feeling I'm gonna get a very mixed response in the comments. Today, when you think of Michael Jordan, you think of Nike. And when you think of Nike, you probably think of Michael Jordan, Air Jordan. But in the early days of their partnership, Michael Jordan and Nike nearly split ways. The huge catalog of Jordans that we all know and love today would not exist if it wasn't for one shoe. A shoe that quite literally rescued Nike from losing their biggest asset. I'm talking about the iconic, the legendary, the Air Jordan 3. In late 1987, Michael Jordan's five-year contract with Nike was coming to an end, and Jordan was pretty set on not renewing. He had grown frustrated with the design direction of the Air Jordan line and wasn't happy with the company. Meanwhile, Rob Strasser, Nike's director of marketing, and Air Jordan 1 designer Peter Moore left the company to create their own venture. Sports Incorporated. Nike feared Strasser and Moore poaching Michael Jordan to Sports Incorporated. If they were going to get MJ to renew the contract with them, it was going to take a miracle. Coming off the success of the Nike Air Max 1, a young Tinker Hatfield would be assigned the task of designing the Air Jordan 3. The shoe was already six months behind schedule, and the pressure to woo Jordan back to Nike was mounting. Up until that point, Michael Jordan felt like his voice didn't really matter when it came to the design of his shoes. Tinker Hatfield's approach was a little different. He was genuinely interested in hearing what Michael's needs were. Unlike his predecessors, Tinker actually sat down with Michael and listened to all his suggestions and requests that he had for the shoe. He found that Michael not only had suggestions, but had very specific demands. The Air Jordan 2 was too heavy and he wanted a lighter shoe. He wanted it to be a mid-top, not too high, not too low. One of the main things Jordan mentioned during their meeting was that he wanted to be able to wear a new pair of shoes for every game. He didn't want the shoes to have to be broken in. He wanted to be able to slip on the shoes and have them be game ready. Many sleepless nights later, Tinker Hatfield emerged with a design for the Air Jordan 3. 
and it was time to present the shoe to Michael Jordan. Presenting the Jordan 3 to Michael was a big challenge in itself. When Tinker Hatfield and Nike founder Phil Knight flew to California to present the new shoe to Jordan, Jordan was nowhere to be found. In fact, he was out golfing with former Nike executives Rob Strasser and Peter Moore, who were pitching MJ their new company. They told Michael he didn't need to depend on Nike, and he could start his own line where he would have complete control over his brand. Four nerve-wracking hours later, Michael Jordan showed up. He had had a long day and wasn't in the best mood. Once the small talk was over, Phil Knight called on Tinker Hatfield to lead the meeting. Tinker pulled the shroud off the Air Jordan 3 and there they were. He quickly reminded Michael of the demands he made. To make the shoes feel like they're broken in right out of the box, Hatfield used tumbled leather, which made the shoe soft and supple in the right places. Hatfield also made a mid-top just like Jordan requested. The first mid-top basketball shoe ever, actually. It was also the first Jordan shoe to feature a visible air unit in the heel. When Michael Jordan had a closer inspection of the shoe and looked at the elephant print and the iconic Jumpman logo, he was sold. Who wouldn't be? Personally, I think the Air Jordan 3 is a masterpiece. To this day, Phil Knight, the founder of Nike, still credits Tinker Hatfield for saving Nike. To market the shoe, Nike and the marketing firm Wyden & Kennedy hired the then up-and-coming director Spike Lee to direct a series of commercials. Spike Lee's 1986 movie Do the Right Thing featured Mars Blackman, an Air Jordan-obsessed character that Spike plays in the movie. Let's watch one of these iconic black and white commercials now. Mars Blackman here again. You know, nobody in the world can cover my main man, Michael Jordan. Nobody, nobody, nobody. No, no, nobody. I'm telling you, it's impossible. 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 Imp However, it's easy to cover Mars Blackman. The Air Jordan 3 debuted in four original colorways. White cement, black cement, fire red, and the true blues. Michael Jordan also had an amazing season where he won MVP and Defensive Player of the Year. During All-Star Weekend in 1988, MJ and Dominique Wilkins battled it out during one of the most famous slam dunk contests in NBA history. Michael Jordan stole the show with his famous dunk from the free throw line. While wearing a pair of crispy Air Jordan 3s, he took flight, and really, the rest is history. We all know that the shoe has been retroed several times and dozens of colorways of the Air Jordan 3 exist. But I'm not going to go through every single little pair here because that would be boring. One interesting thing I'd like to touch on is the fact that the initial sketches that Tinker made for the Air Jordan 3 actually featured a swoosh. Nike recently released versions of the Air Jordan 3 with the swoosh, the Air Jordan 3 Tinker Hatfield. A must cop for any serious Jordan collector. The Air Jordan 3's legacy lives on through the amazing community of sneaker enthusiasts who are passionate about sneakers and appreciate the history behind them. The year is 1989. The Chicago Bulls and the Cleveland Cavaliers are in the final moments of Game 5 of the first round of the NBA playoffs. There are three seconds left on the clock and the Cavs are up 100 to 99. Jordan has been battling Larry Nance and Craig Ello to the death in this last quarter. For this final play, all eyes are on MJ. Everyone knows he will be the one going for the shot to win the game. With just three seconds left on the clock, Sellers inbounds to Jordan. Jordan cuts around Nance and at the foul line, MJ jumps and floats in the air over the outstretched hands of six foot six Craig Ello and shoots. Two seconds to go, puts it up and scores at the buzzer. Michael Jordan has won it for Chicago. In what will come to be forever known as the shot, one of the greatest plays in basketball history, Michael Jordan wins the game for the Bulls defying gravity in a fresh pair of Nike Air Jordan 4s. Back in 1988, MJ wasn't exactly interested in continuing his partnership with Nike, but thanks to Tinker Hatfield, Nike succeeded in securing a renewal of their contract with MJ by wooing him back via one of the most perfectly designed silhouettes of all time, the Air Jordan 3. Proving himself to be the only designer for the job, Tinker Hatfield embarked on the journey of designing the Jordan 3 successor, but this time, he would approach the design with functionality in mind. You see, prior to the Jordan 4, a lot of the design direction for MJ's shoes were motivated by the idea of making a luxury basketball shoe. Tinker, of course, wanted to keep the luxury feel, but he didn't want it to be the main focus of the design. Hatfield kept many of the 3's design elements when designing the 4, keeping the Jumpman logo on the tongue, but this time with the addition of the word flight in a flowing script below, borrowing the same Nike Air logo on the heel as the 3, 
and both shoes featured the same air unit in the heel. Now let's take a look at some of the technical features that Hatfield and his team added to the shoe. A new polyurethane over molded mesh technology decorated the tongue and panels on the upper. Another bold functional element of the four was the sturdy support wings that housed the laces at the top of the shoe and near the toe box. This gave options for the wearer to lace their sneakers in 18 different ways. As for the upper, Hatfield and his team opted for a synthetic leather called Durabuck. The soles on the four remained almost exactly the same as the three, but with a slightly higher visual rise in the middle of the sole. Lastly, in another utilitarian addition, the four featured the iconic pull tab on the heel where the three did not. In 1989, Nike released the Air Jordan 4 for $110 in these four colorways, black cement, white cement, fire red, and military blue. MJ played one of his best statistical seasons ever in the Air Jordan 4s. And as if Jordan's performance and the shot weren't strong enough endorsements of the power of a crisp pair of Air Jordan 4s, the sneaker's reputation was further boosted by Spike Lee. If you watched our video on the history of the Air Jordan 3, then you know a big part of Nike's marketing campaign of the 3s was Mars Blackman, the character that Spike Lee played in his 1986 film She's Gotta Have It, who appeared in commercials for the Jordan 3. The marketing campaign for the Jordan 4s saw Michael Jordan and Mars Blackman appearing together once again in similar commercials. But Spike took the sneaker worship to the next level for the fours when he put them in his 1989 film, Do the Right Thing. He famously made them the centerpiece of a whole scene. Ten years after its initial release, Nike retroed the Jordan 4 in a variety of colorways, like the Columbia and the Oreo, and oh yeah, one highly debated change. The heel logo was changed from the original Nike Air logo to the Jumpman logo. What's your preference, the Jumpman logo or the OG logo? Leave your comment below. Some people feel like the original heel logo was Nike prioritizing the advertisement of their air technology and Nike itself over actually paying tribute to Jordan. In my opinion though, they should at least leave the Nike Air logo on the OG colorways and not mess with the heel logo at all. Over the years, Nike has given us some undeniably dope, classy colorways of the Jordan 4, and also some controversial and downright hated, loud, and crazy colorways. Colorways weren't the only aspect that fell under scrutiny though. The quality and the appearance of the silhouette itself was also widely claimed to have varied from the original and gotten worse over time as more colorways were dropped. Complaints varied, but some of the more serious issues were that some of the uppers and the midsoles were crumbling, flaking, and becoming discolored way too quickly. Consumer outcry about these issues prompted the Jordan brand to introduce their Retro Remaster initiative in 2005, which not only promised to deliver a better made retro, but also brought back the Nike Air logo to the heel of the 4s, just like the OGs. Now, there are a ton of colorways of the Air Jordan 4, and I'm not gonna go through every single one, because there's just so many of them, but here's some of our favorites. The Cavs colorway, the Fear Pack, the Cause, both the undefeated 4s and the M&M and Carhartt Jordan 4s are going for like $16,000 a pair on StockX right now. Right now, there's a pair of undefeated 4s with people bidding up to $20,000 for the shoe in my size. What do you guys think about these Doran Becker 4s? One of many dope releases that came from the Nike Doran Becker Freestyle Program, in which patients from the Doran Becker Children's Hospital in Portland, Oregon, are given the opportunity to design their own shoe. Released in 2011 for $175, this one was created by Isaiah Scott, a then 11-year-old survivor of leukemia. His design was inspired by Nate Robinson's performance in the 2009 Slam Dunk competition, and also inspired by Superman, who Isaiah saw as his alter ego that helped him battle his disease. The shoe is adorned with the logos of Superman on the tongue and Isaiah's own logo, a silhouette of his head on the upper. The colorway was inspired by Nate Robinson's green outfit, Superman's blue costume, and also green kryptonite to symbolize both Superman's weakness and the illness that was Isaiah's own personal kryptonite. Such a cool backstory and dope program that Nike's put together with the Doran Becker Foundation. How do you guys feel about the Jordan 4 Fire Reds? Did you ever get beat up and have your sneakers taken from you? Well, how about getting shot at for your sneakers? Because apparently, sneakerheads in Tallahassee were that hyped for the release of the Fire Reds. Auto news tonight, a man of the Tallahassee Mall this morning waiting to get his hands on the new Michael Jordan shoes was nearly shot and robbed. Tonight, police need your help to find the suspect. Officer Susan Newhouse with Tallahassee Police tell us a line of people were waiting to get inside of the mall to buy the new Air Jordans. That is when they say a man armed with a gun approached one of those customers and tried to rob the victim. 
Now, the victim, we're told, refused and took off. He was then followed by that suspect, who we're told started firing the gun into the air. He then got into a car with the second person and took off. The Jordan 4 will forever remain one of the most sought after Jays of all time. For me, this sneaker is timeless and is one of Jordan brand's best products still to this day. Union LA recently dropped a super interesting Jordan 4 where the tongue is stitched in, giving the wearer the option to remove the stitching or leave it as is. When photos were leaked of the Union 4s, people initially hated the shoe. Now, it's arguably one of the biggest releases of the year. A lot of haters, a lot of people hating on the shoe, but once they saw the official images from Nike, they changed their mind real quick. And don't lie, were you one of those haters? Let us know in the comments and be honest. When I think about World War II, one of the images that immediately pops into my mind is the nose art on military aircrafts that they had back then. The imagery of shark teeth painted on the nose of World War II fighter planes is inseparable from my mind. Alright, alright, but what do these old aircrafts with fangs painted on them have anything to do with the Air Jordan 5? Well, when you take into account how aggressive, vicious, and fearless a basketball player MJ was, it all starts to make sense. In this video, we are going to be taking a closer look at the history and the inspiration behind one of my favorite Jordan models of all time, the Air Jordan 5. The year is 1990 and Michael Jordan is paving the way for his soon to be legendary career. In the 1990 season, Jordan won his second MVP award, averaging 30 plus points per game. That same year, the Chicago Bulls finished first place in their division for the first time in 16 years and set a franchise record with 61 wins in the regular season. They nearly won the championship that year, but they ultimately lost to the Detroit Pistons. But nonetheless, Michael Jordan's hype was at an all-time high. I mean, he had already racked up Rookie of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year, Most Valuable Player, All-Star MVP, All-NBA, and All-NBA Defense, but still had no ring. Regardless, Michael Jordan was already on his fifth signature shoe. The Air Jordan 5 was designed by master shoe designer Mr. Tinker Hatfield in the year 1990. Hatfield had designed the two previous Air Jordan releases, the Air Jordan 3 and the Air Jordan 4. Both had tremendous success, so it was going to be a real challenge for him to reinvent the status quo. What's your favorite Tinker Hatfield design? Leave a comment below. Hatfield spent a lot of time watching Bulls games, carefully observing Michael Jordan's style of playing aggressive and relentless offense. He noticed that Michael would literally attack his opponents from all sides. His mindset would never waver, he just kept fighting. MJ is famous for being deathly competitive. At some point, Tinker Hatfield made the connection between World War II fighter planes and Jordan's mindset. It was a huge inspiration for the shoe. In fact, one of the silhouette's most striking design details are the jagged teeth on the midsole of the shoe. This was inspired by the pilots and Air Force crews that would paint shark mouths on the nose of their planes. Originally, this was done for practical reasons like identifying friendly allies in battle, but it eventually evolved into an expression of individuality. It was a type of escapism for the pilots, a way for them to evoke memories of home and peacetime life. This perfectly complemented Michael Jordan's fearless mindset. Another cool feature of the Jordan 5 was the translucent sole. Tinker Hatfield had just finished working on the design for the Nike Air Max for the 19. 89 film Back to the Future 2. The Nike Air Max featured a translucent sole and this design detail transferred over onto the Jordan 5. It was the first Jordan shoe to feature a translucent sole, something that would become a staple for the Jordan brand moving forward. Tinker Hatfield used 3M Scotchlight material for the tongue, which when dark enough outside, the tongue reflects back to produce a bright, highly visible silver light. This type of material is often used on workwear to increase visibility for construction workers or even runners. The Air Jordan 5 released in four original colorways. White and red, black and metallic, white and fire, and my personal favorite, the grape colorway. One thing to note is that out of the original four, the fire red colorway was the only one that included the number 23 on the shoe. The grape colorway garnered a lot of attention thanks to Will Smith constantly rocking the shoe on the hit sitcom Fresh Prince of Bel Air. The show was so synonymous with the Jordan 5 that Nike released the Bel Air in 2013. And in 2018, they released an official Fresh Prince version of the shoe to celebrate Will Smith's 50th birthday. It was essentially the grape colorway but with no laces. They even blocked out the lace holes so you can't put your own laces in them. I'm not sure if I'd rock those. 
What do you think? The silhouette has been released in nearly 50 colorways, so it would just be insane if I went through them one by one. But hey, let's go over some of my favorites. These are excluding the original four colorways. The Laney colorway. These dropped in 2000 and are inspired by the colors of MJ's high school. The Dorenbeckers. This one dropped in 2013 as part of Nike's annual tradition to raise money for the Dorenbeckers Children's Hospital in Portland, Oregon. The shoe is designed by a child patient from the hospital named Isaac. Its main feature is a poem that Isaac wrote that was printed all over the upper of the shoe. It's a beautiful backstory and it also glows in the dark. Who doesn't want a pair of shoes that glow in the dark? Next up, we've got the Raging Bull colorway. This nearly all red colorway is inspired by muletas, the red cloth you see bullfighters waving in the air to irritate the bulls. Imagine wearing these to a bullfight in Spain. The Supreme Jordan 5 in Desert Camo. This was Supreme's first collab with the Jordan brand. It has all kinds of cool details like the 94 in place of the 23 on the heel counter and the Supreme logo written inside the mesh panels. All right, I'm gonna do three more just because there's so many dope colorways of the shoe and I just think I wouldn't be doing it justice without referencing some of these sneakers. Seriously though, if I didn't mention your favorite Jordan 5, please don't destroy us in the comments. The black grape colorway. What can I say? I'm a sucker for the grape colorway. It might not be as iconic as the original grape colorway, but I'm really digging the 90s vibes on this one. This next one comes from Michael Jordan's son, Marcus Jordan, the Trophy Room collab. The icy blue on these just goes so hard and I love how they kept that fire red for the shark teeth. Too bad they cost about $1,100 on StockX right now or else I'd cop. All right, last one I'm gonna drop on you guys and I know it's gonna piss a lot of you guys off, but the off-white Jordan 5s are fire. The shoe features all of Virgil Abloh's go-tos like the zip tie and the off-white text branding. But the coolest thing about the off-white Jordan 5 are the circular windows around the mid panel and the ankle collar that you can either leave as is or pop out. Either way, I think it's a design that's gonna stand the test of time. What do you guys think? If you know anything about sneakers or basketball in the 90s, you know that by the year 1990, the creators of Nike's signature Air Jordan line already had the game on lock. Michael Jordan had been taking the world of basketball by storm, and Tinker Hatfield had risen to the top of the sneaker design industry and earned his place at the helm of the most influential sneaker franchise the world has ever seen. Much like the clutch plays that Jordan had been executing on the court, leading the Bulls to victory in the face of certain defeat, Tinker Hatfield had saved Nike's relationship with Michael Jordan with his design of the Jordan 3, and since then, the Jordan 4 and the Jordan 5 had been sensational. They made a statement and they established that Air Jordan was here to stay and the best was yet to come from both Michael Jordan and Jordan brand. Like we mentioned earlier, every single Jordan release had been a wild success since Tinker took the reins. The Jordan 3, the Jordan 4, and the Jordan 5 were all massive hits with sneaker fans and each were connected to unforgettable moments in Michael Jordan's career. As most of you know, we've covered the history of most of the sneakers that I just mentioned. So, um, but if you if you haven't checked it out yet, I'll put a little suggestion card here. I know it's early in the video, but I'm gonna put it here just in case you're new and you wanna kind of start from the Jordan 1 to Jordan 2 to Jordan 3 up until the 6. So, boom, right there. When it came to designing the Jordan 6, Tinker again worked closely with MJ, sticking to that classic blend of luxury and performance designs that Jordans had become known for. On the luxury side of things, Hatfield included features like a heel tab inspired by the spoiler of a Porsche and a sleek minimal toe tip that MJ requested himself, citing the sleek tips of the Italian dress shoes he had recently been growing fond of. The spoiler heel tab would be the first of many automobile designs that Tinker Hatfield would incorporate into the Air Jordan line over the years. Another interesting thing about the Jordan 6 is that uh, Michael Jordan actually complained to Nike and Tinker Hatfield about the, the easeability, is that a word, easeability? It basically, all the previous Jordan models before the six, I don't know if you've owned a pair of fours, fives, or threes, especially threes, you can't just slide them on, you know? You gotta really loosen up the laces and put them on. Um, and, and he wanted something that would be more accessible quickly. So when designing the six, Hatfield included large die cut rubberized tongues with two big finger holes. The tongue, along with the heel tab, ensured ease of use and in keeping with Hatfield's approach to the Jordan line, they were, it, I mean, it's classic Tinker Hatfield. They were ergonomic, functional features that also pushed the envelope stylistically, something Tinker Hatfield has always done. I mean, think of like the Nike Air Hirachi, for example, with the neoprene booty. The Jordan 6 first launched in 1991, retailing for $125, and it came in five original colorways. The infrareds, the varsity reds, the carmines, the off-white and maroon colorway, and the white and sport blue. 
Depending on the colorway, the Jordan 6's main material was either new buck or full grain leather. And like the Jordan 5, it featured lace locks and clear segments of rubber on the outsole. The Jordan 6 was kind of like the last Nike Jordan because after the Jordan 6, uh, Nike and Air Jordan as brands kind of established their own identity. So in that way, this was kind of like the last Jordan with an air, a visible air unit for a long time. In fact, the air unit wouldn't be seen again on a J until many years later on the Jordan 16. The Jordan 6 would also be the last Jordan to sport Nike branding on the shoe's exterior. And finally, in a similar spirit, the Jordan 6 would be the final Air Jordan model promoted by the familiar ad campaign that we all love featuring Spike Lee's Mars Blackman character. With the Jordan 6, Tinker had delivered another classic, certain to go down in history as a sneakerhead favorite. I know the infrareds are some grails for some of you guys out there, and I get it, trust me, it's a dope sneaker. But even more legendary than the design of this shoe, was the performance of the player who wore it. And I'm talking about Michael Jordan. Jordan made unforgettable plays in the Air Jordan models. But the six is the sneaker that Jordan wore as he led the Bulls in the charge to their first ever championship win. In the 1990-91 season, Jordan racked up the accolades, man. He had 31.5 points per game average. Of course, he was voted first team all NBA, first team all defense, six time all star, league MVP, and finally the NBA Finals MVP. MJ had been racking up personal accolades for years, and no previous individual accomplishment could compare to the glory of leading Chicago to their very first championship win. It was an emotional moment of vindication for the Bulls and everyone who had been rooting for them. Through trial and error, the promising wins and the discouraging losses, the Bulls had finally made it, and Michael Jordan finally held the trophy in his hands. All right, so now that we got the history of the shoe out of the way, let's look into some of the most classic colorways of the Jordan 6, and some of my favorites, and probably some of your favorites. I'd love to know which are your favorites, so leave it, damn, I said favorites like five times. I'd love to know which ones you guys like the most. Um, post it in the comments below. There's the All-Star, sometimes referred to as the Chameleon, sporting an iridescent colorway similar to that of the Jordan 1 All-Star. Well, how about the Olympics? Man, these are classic. They were worn by Ray Allen during the Sydney Olympic Games. Definitely one of my favorites. There are the Green Suede and Like Mike Gatorade collabs. We've also got the Air Jordan 6 Low, which debuted in 2006 and retro in 2015. I don't know how I feel about those. We also have the Thorenbeckers, released in February 2019, which retailed for $190. Always dope to see what comes from the Becker freestyle program. The Defining Moments pack, probably one of the most classic, classic Jordan colorways of all time, um, with those gold hits. Uh, you know, we, we just saw a retro of that last year. Um, I didn't cop, by the way, but I should have. I kind of regret it now. But how about Jordan 6 cleats, which have kind of been like a common sight on the feet of Jordan sponsored NFL players like Earl Thomas and Des Bryant. I think some of, most of those are customs, but I think it's dope that NFL players rock Jordans on the field. It's kind of wild. Cigar and champagne colorways, inspired by Mike celebrating the championship win with cigars and champagne. And you guys know MJ loves cigars. So both these models rock an embossed stamp on the heel and insole and gold championship ring lace locks. Like we've seen with some Jordan releases and retros, we saw minor differences from the originals and the most notable and obviously the most controversial would be the Nike Air logo to the Jumpman logo. Also, there were some weird color changes and they also added 3M reflective fabric to the perforated holes in the body of the sneaker, which is actually a design feature that I really like. Coming off the high of Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls' first ever championship win in 1991, Nike's Air Jordan brand had not only the prolific line of Tinker Hatfield designed Jordan sneakers under the belt, but also a partnership with the new champions of basketball. With Nike's presence so firmly established, some designers might have kept doing more of the same old thing in an effort to render the same success. But the creative minds behind Air Jordan would once again show the world that evolution was the true identity of Jordan brand. This next sneaker would be an opportunity to move the brand into a new phase, shedding some familiar Jordan methods before they became stale, not to mention also shedding a big part of their identity. By now, you know that designer Tinker Hatfield had championed the progression of Air Jordan ever since he took the reins all the way back with the Jordan 3. Since then, every new Jordan model displayed a constant evolution, new construction elements and technology, new and unique inspiration for the design aesthetic. And you know, we also see a unique approach to how Air Jordan injects pop culture into their marketing. But before we dig into the sports history, marketing, and cultural impact of the Jordan 7, let's take a look at its design. This one was way different than the last couple Jordan models, so we've got a couple things to discuss. Right off the bat, 
Biggest thing to know about the Jordan 7, no Nike branding. No Nike swoosh, no Nike Air on the heel, no visible Nike branding, except for a sneaky Nike Air on the insole. This, among other distinct absences of previous design elements, this indicated a new direction for Air Jordan. The direction was away from Nike, separate from Nike, at least in regards to brand identity. Next big example of this, no air unit. The Jordan 3, 4, 5, and 6, they all had visible air units, and all of them had Nike air branding on the sneaker's heel, or at least the OG releases did. Seeing as Michael Jordan's career was blowing up so massively, in addition to the success of the Air Jordan line, Nike's marketing department must have been thinking that Air Jordan had the potential to outgrow the constraints of simply being a line of Nike's signature models. So they made moves to shift the identity of Air Jordan towards being its own brand. I feel like we as consumers did feel that shift too. You're not just copying a fresh pair of new Nikes, you're copying a fresh new pair of J's. The next big talking point on the Jordan 7's design is that it included a neoprene booty, technology from another recent Nike release, the Nike Air Hirachi. Now we've done a whole video on the Hirachi, which you should definitely check out if you want to know more about. But basically, the deal with the neoprene booty is that it was designed to conform really nicely to different shapes of feet, much like the neoprene booty of a water ski. As for the overall aesthetic of the 7, it didn't seem to take much of that inspiration from the Hirachi. And unlike previous Jordan models that had been inspired by sports cars and fighter jets, the 7's aesthetics were inspired by the colorful triangular motifs of traditional West African art. And the overall shape of the sneaker itself will tell you from a mile away that this sneaker is a Jordan. But at a closer look, the typical luxury or futuristic elements of the Jordan line sat this one out. The sharp triangular ridges of the 7's outsole had replaced the futuristic translucent ice outsole of its predecessors. A couple other details. The 7 had a simple pull loop on the heel, a drastic change from the 6's Porsche-inspired spoiler of a heel tab. That pull loop tucked into a triangle on the heel that sported MJ's jersey number 23. The tongue was made of neoprene, and on some models, like the hair and the Bordeaux, it just shouted out loud, colorful triangular motifs. One final unique detail to the 7 is a Jumpman logo in the window of the lace lock. Now that we've covered the design details of the Jordan 7, let's talk about some of Jordan's stats and accolades the year that he actually used the Jordan 7 on court. Prior Air Jordan models had accompanied Michael Jordan through his greatest achievements in basketball, his most decorated seasons of play. But the Jordan 7s were about to accompany him into his best year of basketball yet. In 92, Jordan was awarded first team all defense, first team all NBA, his sixth league scoring title, NBA MVP, and finals MVP. To top it all off, Jordan performed incredibly as part of the United States Dream Team at the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona, earning his second Olympic gold medal. This Olympic achievement was commemorated by a special Olympic version of the Air Jordan 7, which sported Mike's Olympic jersey number nine on the heel badge instead of a 23. Working once again with Wyden and Kennedy, the same marketing firm that developed the Mars Blackman ad campaign used for the last four Jordan models, Air Jordan called upon a much different but even more widely renowned icon from pop culture to tout their newest model. That icon was Bugs Bunny. It's easy to see that these two commercials set the stage for the iconic movie Space Jam, which followed not long after these ads. This collab also inspired the hair and the Marvin the Martian colorways of the Jordan 7. Alright guys, now that we've covered the history of the Jordan 7, we're going to get into some of our favorite colorways and some of your favorite colorways too. So I'd love to hear uh, what your favorite colorway is down there in the comments. And also, if you're enjoying this video, please give it us a like. In 92, the Air Jordan 7 dropped in five original colorways and retailed for $125. Those five colorways were the Bordeaux, Hair, Olympic, Raptor, and Cardinals. Let's look at some later releases. There's the Jordan 7 Year of the Rabbit, somewhat similar to the hair colorway. I love the Jordan 7 Ray Allens. The purples and the greens are just so 90s it's perfect. In collaboration with Dutch streetwear brand Pata, there are two different colorways of the Air Jordan 7 Pata. One of my favorites is the Air Jordan 7 Paris Saint Germain. There had been PSG collabs for the Jordan 1, 4, 5, and 6, but the 7 is my favorite of them. There's some really cool details on the shoe, but the translucent mesh windows just do it for me. Part of a pack that commemorated Jordan's 91-93 championship run, the Air Jordan 7 Reflections of a Champion was a similar colorway to those he wore on the court in 92, but wrapped in a reflective 3M material. There's the Jordan 7 Bin 23 based on one of Tinker Hatfield's original design sketches of the 7. 
There's the Air Jordan 7 Mira Olympic, released in 2008, which was inspired by a sculpture by Spanish artist Joan Miro, hearkening back to the 1992 Olympic Games in Barcelona. The 7 saw another Dornbecker collab. This is a unique one with lots of personal touches. It really deserves its own video. Get a load of the Jordan 7 sweater. It's based on a sweater shorts combo that MJ wore alongside Larry Bird in a 93 McDonald's Super Bowl commercial. Much like the Jordan 6 cigar and champagne pack that celebrated MJ's first ever NBA championship, the Jordan 7 got its own cigar and champagne pack to celebrate his second championship. These models had similar details to the CNC 6s, such as the championship ring on the laces. There's the Air Jordan 7 Barcelona Knights, which came out in March of 2015, and a lot of people thought that these were the Jordan 7 Marvin the Martians colorway, possibly just renamed to avoid any copyright issues. However, later on in 2015, the official Marvin the Martian Jordan 7 was dropped, and everyone who thought they already had a pair of the Marvin the Martians was confused and probably disappointed, to be honest. It's 1993, and the Chicago Bulls are back in the NBA Finals. In 93, the Bulls and championship games were no strangers to each other, but this time, it was different. This is their third NBA Finals in three years, and they've already won two in a row, so it's a potential three-peat, something that hadn't been seen around the league since the Boston Celtics did it in 1961. We all know how it went down though. Michael Jordan and the Bulls willed their way to the Bulls' first ever three-peat in 1993. Three championship victories in a row, man. A historic moment that appropriately calls for a historic piece of footwear. The Air Jordan 8. The task of following up the Jordan 7 was of course assigned to the brilliant and charismatic Nike designer, Tinker Hatfield. The Air Jordan 8 was a huge departure from the African motif-inspired Air Jordan 7. This time around, the Jordan 8 was filled with all kinds of quirky features. One of the more unique design features on the Jordan 8 was the addition of a double strap down system. Designed for elite lockdown support, two straps cross over each other like an X and lock down with flaps on the heel, drawing everything in like a straight jacket. This was classic Tinker Hatfield design. In fact, the year prior, Tinker Hatfield designed the 1992 Nike Air Raid Silhouette, a shoe made to withstand the rigors of outdoor basketball that also featured a crisscross strap support system. The Nike Air Raid 2 that released the following year is so alarmingly similar in appearance to the Jordan 8 that Jordan Brand has since released an Air Jordan 8 Tinker Air Raid colorway inspired by the OG Air Raid 2 colorway. As for the cushioning setup, the Air Jordan 8 featured an air unit in the forefoot and the heel, staying pretty consistent with other Jordan models up until this point. The supportive upper of the shoe did come with the price though. The shoe was notably very warm and bulky. Thick padding, straps, no mesh, all natural materials like suede and leather, the shoe was just heavy. Some people even speculate that Michael Jordan's on and off battle with athlete's foot during that season was because of the Jordan 8. You guys ever had athlete's foot before? It sucks, I used to get it all the time when I was a skater. If you've had athlete's foot, subscribe to this channel. For me, the most iconic design detail is the Chanel Tongue Jumpman emblem. It has a carpet-like quality that I really like, and I'm not sure what's more 90s, the mud guards on the side of the shoe or this logo. As for the marketing for the shoe, the Air Jordan 8 had one of the wackiest commercials for a sneaker ever, and was kind of a preview of what we would see years later with Michael Jordan and Space Jam. Across the universe, people are asking, what fiend would steal Air Jordans? Oh goody, more Air Jordans for me. Pebble Beach. This is no way for a pamper superstar to travel. What the? Shoes. <gasps> and they're all mine. Give me those Air Jordans. No, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, no, yes, no, yes, no, no, no. Take these or else. The Air Jordan 8 released in 1993 in three original colorways. The Bugs Bunny, a white leather base pair with red and gray accents. The Playoffs, which had a black Durabuck upper with red and white accents. Or as some of you call them, the Air Jordan 8 breads. And then there's probably the most desirable OG colorway of the 8, the Aqua. Personally my favorite. Similar build to the playoffs, but this time featuring purple and teal, a pretty popular color scheme for the 90s. Michael Jordan would wear these in the 1993 All-Star Game, where he scored 18 points and 5 assists right after listening to Boyz II Men perform the national anthem. For the Fun fact, the Air Jordan 8 Aquas 
are forever embedded into the minds of people who watch the 90s sitcom Roseanne. Thanks to when Roseanne's son in the show, DJ Connors, puts up his fresh Air Jordan 8 Aquas on the table during an episode. In 2003, Jordan Brand released a low version of the Jordan 8, which is just, I don't know. It's tough for me to love these, but I guess the lower cut kind of gives it a modern feel. What do you think? Leave it in the comments below. The Jordan 8 doesn't really get a whole lot of love from Jordan Brand nowadays, but there are a few solid non-OG colorways, like the Peapods and the Chromes. I will say this though, the Jordan 8 had some fire player exclusives. The green and black Ray Allen Boston Celtics is so dope with the Sugar Ray spelled out on the ankle collar. Another one of my favorites is the Q Rich PE, which boasted a fire New York Knicks theme. Josh and Juwan Howard, Chris Paul and even Kobe Bryant would all don their own PEs of this underappreciated silhouette. Even Toronto Raptors superfan and hip hop icon Drake had some fire OVO Jordan 8s made for him. A luxurious take on the simple black and white colorway his OVO collabs are famous for. I'd say the most recent moment for the Jordan 8 was the pair the brand made for the Washington Wizards' Rui Hachimura. This sneaker is inspired by Rui's Japanese heritage and his time on the Japanese Olympic basketball team. It's a dope sneaker for sure and I saw a lot of people in our Facebook group posting photos of it and it looks fire, I gotta admit. As the 1993 NBA regular season came to an end, Charles Barkley of the Phoenix Suns would win most valuable player for the regular season. And with the Suns facing the Bulls in the NBA Finals, Michael Jordan made it a point to show the world who the real MVP was. The Bulls won their third straight championship and shocked the world. Shortly after, on October 6, 1993, Michael Jordan held a press conference and in front of the world told everybody he was retiring from the game. It's crazy when you think about it, like the last time we would have saw Michael Jordan on the court with some Jordans on, he would have had the Air Jordan 8, that's where it would have ended. And although the 8 didn't have any iconic Jordan moments, no crazy dunks or memorable game winning buzzer beaters, it was the shoe that capped off the Bulls first 3 P, which is a huge deal in itself. But hey, a lot of you guys think you're subscribed to the channel, but you're not. You're seeing it and you're recommended, but you're not subscribed, so go ahead and just hit that subscribe button for me, it would really help us out. Today, we're going to be taking a closer look at the history of the underappreciated Air Jordan 9. After winning three championships in a row, Michael Jordan sent shockwaves through the sports world when he announced that he was retiring from the game of basketball. Famously told the press, he was fulfilled and felt that there was no more to accomplish in his career as a basketball player. Whether his reason for retiring is true or not, he wasn't done with sports. And several months after his widely publicized retirement, Michael Jordan would send shockwaves to the sports world once again when he signed a contract with the Birmingham Barons, a minor league baseball team affiliated with the Chicago White Sox. Fun fact, Nike actually made a baseball cleat for Michael to use during his short-lived baseball career. But before his first retirement, Michael Jordan and his peers, specifically the 1992 Dream Team, helped usher in a new era of basketball. And thanks to this, basketball's popularity skyrocketed and became an international phenomenon. And with basketball becoming a beloved global sport, naturally, basketball's biggest star, Michael Jordan, also became an international phenomenon. And that's where the story of the Air Jordan 9 begins. The Air Jordan 9 represented the globalization of the Air Jordan brand name. Everybody around the world wanted to be like Mike. Take a close look at the soles of the shoe. We designed the different languages around the world that describe the sporting spirit of Michael Jordan and what it has done for the world of sports. Tinker Hatfield. During the 1992 Olympic Games, a dream team led by NBA stars Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, and Larry Bird electrified basketball on a global stage. In the wake of the Barcelona Games where the United States won all of its games by huge margins, National Basketball Federation Federations overseas rode the wave of basketball's rekindled popularity among kids who now aspired to play in the world's elite championship. They improved homegrown hoops training, drills and techniques, often aided by US born and MBA clinics. Growth of satellite television and video recording technology, as well as the internet, expanded the ability of coaches and players to watch MBA games and study the moves and styles that were exhibited on North American basketball courts. Air Jordan also rode this wave, and when it came time to design the Air Jordan 9, Tinker Hatfield and Mark Smith took this newfound international stardom into consideration. When the Air Jordan 9 released in November of 1993, Michael Jordan was nowhere near a basketball court. In fact, Michael Jordan didn't even grace a basketball court in a pair of Jordan 9 until he was playing for the Washington Wizards in the early 2000s. Fun fact, though he didn't play in the Jordan 9 as a member of the Chicago Bulls, the sneakers are featured 
on the statue outside the United Center that the Bulls erected for him when he first retired. The Air Jordan 9 released in four original colorways, the OG white, black, true red pair, and a year later, the powder blue 9, the charcoal, and my personal favorite, the olive Air Jordan 9. The design for the shoe is almost boot-like at first glance, a much sleeker looking silhouette compared to its predecessor, the bulky Air Jordan 8. I think the lace holes and the speed lacing system is what gives it a boot feel to me. However, the sneaker did carry over a design element from the Air Jordan 8, the infamous neoprene sock booty. One of the standout details of the silhouette is the red Jumpman Globe logo on the pool tab, which is a nod to Air Jordan and basketball itself going global. There is, of course, the most iconic attribute on the shoe, the unforgettable Air Jordan 9 outsole. And man, it is beautiful to look at. Straight away, you can see the Star and Jumpman logo in front of a giant 1994 graphic because the shoe was released in 1994. To the left of that, you will see kanji lettering that means world and Japanese hiragana spells out sports, so like world sports. Right beneath that, there's a zigzag line that is actually a tribute to the Jordan 5 shark tooth design detail. Moving our way to the top left, you'll see the globe graphic and to the right of that is where things get really cool. Each shoe has five words embedded into the outsole, 10 words total in seven different languages. Each word speaks to MJ's way of living on and off the court. We were talking about competition, about winning. The approach to basketball and those same terms meant more than just basketball. They should be viewed as a blueprint for a good life, Mark Smith. Let's go through every word one by one. Also, if you're enjoying this video, subscribe to the channel. Right shoe, dead end, which means dedicated for French. Forza, which means force in Spanish. Denso, which means intense in Italian, obviously. Liberté, which means freedom in French. And Mutig, which means graceful in German. All right, let's move over to the left shoe. And it starts off with some Russian, which honestly, I can't even pronounce it. I think it just said sport. So sport, which means sport in Russian. Uhuru, which means independence in Swahili. Again, I can't even pronounce this word, but it means freedom in Russian. Athletish, which means athletic in German. And mundaji, which means hope in Swahili. Wow. I hope I didn't offend anybody by the way I pronounced those. I, I'm trying the best I can here. As for the marketing of the shoe, Nike flexed its genius marketing muscle with the John Kilroy campaign, a series of ads promoting the shoe. The most memorable commercial from the campaign is one that features Steve Martin and debuted during the 1994 Super Bowl between the Cowboys and the Bills. Let's have a look. Good evening, America. I'm Steve Martin. A few months ago, the world was shocked by Michael Jordan's retirement. It's time for me to move away from the game of basketball. Three weeks later, I received a mysterious package from a fan of the Billings Bandits. Dear Steve, this guy, Motorboat Jones, looks a lot like Michael Jordan. When I spoke of this on a national talk show... At first I think it's just another kook, but then I, then I realized it actually could be Michael Jordan. The floodgates opened. Incredible stories of exceptional basketball players. Players who all uncannily resembled Michael Jordan. Then, this audio tape turned up. There are some awesome non-OG Air Jordan 9 colorways, but one of the bigger moments for the Air Jordan 9, in my opinion, was the Kilroy pack back in 2012 six separate colorways of the Air Jordan 9, each one based on a fictional alter ego of Michael Jordan created in the original Kilroy ad campaign. The pack includes the Air Jordan 9 Johnny Kilroy, the Fonte Montana, the Bentley Ellis, the Slim Jenkins, the Motorboat Jones, and the Calvin Bailey. Some honorable mentions for non-OG colorways are the Jordan 9 Birmingham Baron, which obviously pays tribute to MJ's time with the team, the Dorenbeckers, which was made in collaboration with 11-year-old Oswaldo Jimenez, a patient at Doran Becker's Children's Hospital. The design incorporates details about Oswaldo, like the tongue, which reads pollito, which means little chicken in Spanish. The sock liner has a feathery-like texture, also paying tribute to that same nickname his parents gave him. The red and green outsoles honors his hometown of Querétaro, Mexico. All in all, I love the Doran Becker program that Nike does, and it's always fun to see what these kids come up with. Maybe we'll do a video dedicated to all the Doran Becker Jordans in the future here. I'm back. That was all Michael Jordan had to say to completely change the landscape of the basketball world. Jordan was done playing baseball. The Chicago Bulls had their superstar back. However, while Jordan was on the diamond, Nike had no clue what to do. They thought Jordan brand was done for good. But on March 18th of 1995, the infamous facts would come through. I'm back. A single fax would send shockwaves through the NBA, and the very next day, Mike would make his return against the Reggie Miller-led Indiana Pacers. Unfortunately, MJ's first game back would end up in a loss. He would put up 19 points, 6 rebounds, and 6 assists. Not the best stat line of his career. But the real question for us sneaker enthusiasts is, what shoes was he wearing for his big return? That sneaker, my friends, 
was the Air Jordan 10. The Air Jordan 10 is a peculiar shoe in Michael Jordan's timeline. The legendary sneaker designer Tinker Hatfield would be designing the shoe yet again, but Jordan was absent for most of the process. The Jordan 10 was designed during a time when Michael Jordan was playing baseball and not basketball. How do you make a basketball shoe for the greatest basketball player of all time who was busy playing baseball? Tinker and the Jordan brand team really thought that Michael Jordan was done playing basketball. Like, for real, the iconic Air Jordan line as we know it today was supposed to stop with the Air Jordan 10. Design-wise, the shoe played it more safe. It was more focused on being familiar and classic. Drawing inspiration from Michael's career rather than being risky and innovative like previous models, the Air Jordan 10 consisted of traditional materials like leathers and suede, and some performance features that are not that exciting like a Phylon midsole with a full-length air unit. One of the design features that was carried over from the Jordan 9 was the speed lay system, a performance feature that was designed to be able to just pull the top of the laces and be able to tighten it all the way down the shoe. On the 9, it was implemented with plastic pieces the laces would go through, but on the Jordan 10, it was much more incorporated into the design by having the laces run through the stripes on the upper, a design feature that would make its way to the Jordan 11 as well. And then there's the outsole, arguably one of the most iconic outsoles in the history of the Jordan line. Like I said before, Tinker and the Jordan team thought he was done for. This forced them to reflect on a basketball career that in their minds was finished. The outsole of the Air Jordan 10 lists an accomplishment for every year Jordan was in the league. His 85 Rookie of the Year award, the time he dropped 63 points in 1986, 87 his first scoring title, 1988 the slam dunk champ, 1989 all I've never understood what 94 beyond meant, um, but I'd love to hear what you think. Leave it in the comments down below. Also, if you're enjoying this video, please give it a like. It would really help us out. Released in 1994, the Air Jordan 10 dropped in three original colorways. The first pair to release was the Steel 10s, a white leather upper with black and gray striping on the eye state and the soles. But what this debut Jordan 10 had was a toe cap. You see, Michael Jordan had no input on the Jordan 10. He was busy playing baseball. And once he saw the toe cap, he absolutely hated it. It was impossible to change it at that point, but Michael Jordan would order that going forward, the toe cap would be removed, giving the shoe a more streamlined and uniform upper. Two other pairs released in 1994 alongside the Steels. The Shadows, which featured a dark gray, almost black suede upper, and a black leather eye stay. And then of course, there was the Powder Blues. White leather upper with black eye stays, and an almost Carolina blue liner in outsole detailing. The following year, Jordan Brand made the decision to release a pack of Jordan 10 colorways, all inspired by various NBA teams and their flagship colors. It's kind of a weird decision nowadays, like for a signature athlete, imagine LeBron James 8 in, inspired by Clippers colorways or, or in Kings colorways, it would just be strange. There were the Chicago's, the Seattle's, Orlando's, the New York, and the Sacramento's. The Chicago's are the pair that Jordan would actually wear in his return to the hardwood. But this Michael Jordan looked a little different. He was wearing number 45 on his jersey and not the 23 we all knew him by. You see, Michael Jordan came out of retirement with a new number because he felt the number 23 was special and it was tied to a time when his father was still alive and watched him play. I didn't want to wear a 23 because I knew my father wasn't there to watch me and I felt like it was a new beginning and 45 was my first number when I was playing in high school. Nonetheless, the sneaker Jordan wore in his return would feature the number 45 stitch on the side to go along with his new threads. And this player exclusive version of the 10 would actually see a release years later in 2015. Fast forward to now, more than 25 years later, the New York and Sacramento pairs of the Jordan 10 are the only pairs not to retro from any of the original releases in 1984 and 1995. Jordan Brand would revisit the City Pack idea in 2006 with the release of the Chicago's, New York, Los Angeles, Charlotte, Rio, London, Shanghai, and Paris. I know the Jordan 10 isn't everybody's favorite Jordan, but I think they made some really dope colorways that weren't a part of the original eight that released in the 90s. Some of my favorites include the Cherries, the Doran Beckers, and the Lennons. There are also a lot of cool sample pairs that were made, including the Rainbow Pack, the Georgetowns, History of Flights, and the Pantones. I personally think it's a beautiful silhouette. Strangely, where we would see the Jordan 10 actually get the love it deserves is on the football field. Numerous football players would also get their own PE just in cleat form. For some reason, it's super popular in the NFL and I don't, really don't know why. If you catch a Monday night football game, you might see Dak Prescott, uh, Chase Claypool, 
and Jamal Adams, they all have Jordan 10 PEs on when they take the field. Although the 10 wouldn't get a whole lot of court time from Jordan, it was the footwear of choice for the infamous double nickel game. In Mike's return to Madison Square Garden, he would put up 55 points, 4 rebounds, and 2 assists, but come playoff time, Michael Jordan would switch to the Jordan 11, and would ultimately lose to the Penny Hardaway and Shaq-led Orlando Magic. Not that long ago, the Jordan 10 was the canvas for Drake's OVO brand, in which they dropped a black and white pair which I think are super fire if you ask me. Since then, the silhouette has been pretty dormant in terms of collabs and releases, but regardless, well at least in my opinion, I think it's one of the best looking Jordans of all time. What you're watching right now is one of the most emotional moments in sports history. Michael Jordan collapses on the floor in total surrender to his emotions after winning his fourth championship title with the Chicago Bulls. What made this moment especially memorable was the fact that everyone knew MJ had just lost his father a few years prior, and this championship was won on Father's Day out of all days. For sneakerheads like you and I, most of MJ's iconic moments are tied to a specific silhouette or colorway. Think of the Air Jordan 3 during the 1988 dunk contest, or the Jordan 12s he wore during the famous flu game during the 1997 finals. But the sneaker in question for this video is the legendary Air Jordan 11. By the end of 1993, Michael Jordan had already cemented himself as the GOAT, the greatest player of all time. After winning his third consecutive championship at only 30 years old, he had already established himself as one of the greatest players in basketball history, and a global icon at that. Then, right in the middle of his prime, he declared he was walking away from the game that he loved, a decision he made after the untimely death of his father, James Jordan. In 1994, Jordan signed a minor league baseball contract with the White Sox a move that shocked and stunned the sports world. Equally perplexing was what to do with his signature basketball shoe line. In fact, Nike had plans to discontinue his signature line after the Jordan 10. However, while everyone else at Nike assumed the line was over, Tinker Hatfield was hopeful that MJ would return to the court and decided to start working on the design for the Jordan 11 in secret. By the way, if you've been watching this channel for a while and you don't know who Tinker Hatfield is by now, I don't know what to tell you. Tinker is the man behind all the important Jordan silhouettes after the Jordan 2. He's one of the greatest sneaker designers in the world. You should look him up. Tinker Hatfield. I'm gonna just put my foot up on the table here because uh, this was a super high performance shoe called the Jordan 11. And uh, this shoe was, like, I think it's my all time favorite shoe because there is so much technology in this shoe. Let's go over some of the technology that Tinker Hatfield is referring to. The most notable and to be honest the most classy detail of the sneaker is the patent leather. While studying Michael Jordan's playing, Tinker noticed that when Michael would change directions during an intense moment in the game, his foot would roll over the sole of his shoes. To counter that, Tinker used patent leather which helped prevent this from happening. You can also thank the classy patent leather for the cheesy trend of pimping out your groomsmen and Jordan 11s for your wedding. Seriously though, it does go good with the suit. Jordan Brand even released a new colorway called the Cap and Gown which recognizes the Air Jordan 11's unique place at graduation ceremonies. The Air Jordan 11 also came equipped with the carbon fiber shank that dramatically made the shoe lighter than previous Air Jordan models. The mesh on the shoe is called Cordura Nylon, also known as Ballistic Mesh. This aided in making the sneaker lighter as well, but it's a tough material that Tinker used to withstand MJ's high level of playing. Not a huge surprise, but clearly one of the great comebacks since Burt Reynolds' hairline. It came in a two-word statement which is now just begging to have a Nike campaign built around it, quote-unquote, I'm back. That's all Jordan said on Saturday. That was really all Jordan needed to say as his 17-month retirement came to an end. He will be back on Sunday when the Bulls play the Pacers, and probably not so coincidentally, the game is on national TV. The Bulls arrived in Indianapolis on Saturday night, and while Michael Jordan was not on the team charter, he will be there by game time, and that makes Phil Jackson happy. We're all very happy about this. Uh, we think it's going to be great for our basketball club. We hope expectations, which are going to be high, aren't overreaching for what we have as a basketball club. We're just glad he's getting back on the court. I'm happy that he's back. I think he's going to add a lot to uh, the NBA, especially in the playoffs. I think he's back because he was missing competition and he's ready to go again. Michael Jordan debuted the Air Jordan 11 in a legendary Concord colorway during game one of the Eastern Conference semifinals between the Chicago Bulls and Orlando Magic. According to Tinker Hatfield, Nike wanted to wait to release the shoe. 
But Michael didn't care. He loved the Air Jordan 11 so much that he couldn't wait to wear them on the court. This came at a price though. Due to the shoe's black and white color blocking and lack of Chicago Bulls red color, Jordan was fined $5,000 for wearing the sneakers. This only lasted for the first two games of the finals. For game three, MJ hilariously borrowed a pair of Air Flight 1s from Penny Hardaway. By the time game four rolled around, Nike made Jordan an 11 with a black upper to avoid the fines. The problem with the shoes, he has not been wearing the right shoes, but today he will sport a brand new pair of shoes. They are black patent leather. They are very stylish. The only one thing is they are a little bit out of style because on the back of them, they have number 45. So if he's not wearing his old shoes, I guess there's nothing else that I could do but take his old shoes home. Marv? Yes. <laughs> The colorway in question is what we know today as the Space Jam 11s, named after the movie because he wore them throughout the entire film. The Jordan 11 first released to the public in November of 1995 in the Concord colorway. The black and red colorway, also commonly referred to as the bread colorway, and the white and Columbia blue pair released the following year in 1996. The initial release of the shoe was so successful that Nike decided to drop low top versions of the shoe, which resulted in Tinker Hatfield doing a summer, more laid back version of the 11, the Air Jordan 11 IE. Now, this shoe kind of has a reputation for being one of those sneakers that you either love or hate. Personally, I think the shoes are pretty dope, I, you know, in the right colorway, and if you could pull them off, I think the Jordan low IE isn't too bad but what do you guys think leave your thoughts below The OG 11s were retroed in 2000, and in 2001, the classic cool gray colorway was released. I love this colorway, it's so dope. 2001 was a huge year for the Jordan 11, with the Space Jams finally getting a proper release. The Space Jams were a highly anticipated release. After the release of the Space Jams, Nike sort of set the tone for the future of their retro program for Jordan. In fact, Jordan brand releases either a retro or a new Jordan 11 colorway annually. Since 2006, every year, usually around the holidays, a Jordan 11 ends up on Santa's list. In 2012, the public was so fervent about the Jordan 11 Concord retro that they actually caused a mall stampede across several cities in the country. You will not believe all the reports of violence that broke out when people rushed to get the newest pair of Air Jordans. A crowd busted through this door in Indiana. And remember, as you're watching these pictures, this is all over shoes. A few people got trampled. Doors were ripped right off their hinges. The Air Jordan retro shoes just went on sale early Friday morning. Since I was a kid, I've been, you know, working hard just to come up here early in the morning just to wait in <laughs> line to get these shoes. I was the first person out of everybody that was out here to get these right here. How many pairs of Air Jordans do you have? I have about nine pair of Air Jordans, but it does not matter about those. It matter about these right here. The silhouette has been retro dozens of times throughout the years. Not only is it being constantly retroed, but Jordan brand continues to use the Jordan 11 as a canvas for new colorways and to experiment with new materials. I'd go as far as to say it's probably the perfect Jordan shoe ever made in terms of functionality and style in one package. This year marks the shoe's 25th anniversary, so hopefully we'll see some kind of Jordan 11 drop during the holidays. Maybe some breads again? I don't know, I'd love me a pair of breads 11s, but I always take an L. Hey Jordan, I'm a size 10 by the way. We as sneakerheads tend to attribute a great deal of Air Jordan's success to either Tinker Hatfield's expertise as a designer or Michael Jordan's legendary skill as a player. But there is another ingredient in Jordan Brand's secret sauce that bears acknowledgement. That secret ingredient is the relationship with the player. There are plenty of stories of brands signing deals with star players then neglecting their input and designing a shoe that the player doesn't really vibe with at all. If you watched our videos on the Jordan 2 and the Jordan 3, then you know that MJ was not happy with his relationship with Nike after the relative failure of the Air Jordan 2. He was literally ready to sign with another brand. Tinker Hatfield saved that relationship and secured MJ's partnership not by simply designing a dope successor to the Air Jordan 2, but by showing MJ that his voice was going to be heard. That his influence would impact the design of his own signature sneakers. Almost a decade later, 
Tinker Hatfield would design his 10th Air Jordan sneaker, and this one is a landmark that shows us the potential of a genuine collaboration with the athlete. Today, we're taking a look at the history of the Air Jordan 12. Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. If you are a regular viewer of the show, well then welcome back. Well, we'd love to have you tune in. And if this is your first time, well then you've come to the right place because on this channel, my brother Nacho and I break down all things in sneaker history and sneaker culture. And I think you're really gonna enjoy it. All right guys, with that out of the way, let's get into the history of the Air Jordan 12. The core design of the Air Jordan 12 was based largely on two things. The rays of the Japanese rising sun flag gave us the stitch paneling pattern on the upper, and a particular 19th century woman's dress shoe called the Nishoki inspired the stacked heel look and the overall shape of the silhouette. This is what I'm talking about with the trust between the designer and the athlete. How many male basketball players would be open to uh, their shoe being inspired by some dusty old uh, women's dress shoe? Not a lot. And this is what makes Tinker Hatfield's relationship with Michael Jordan very special. Jordan took no issue with the inspiration. After all, Tinker Hatfield had already drawn on Mike's love of luxury fashion and Italian dress shoes as inspiration for previous Jordan models. Around the time of the 12's release, Nike officially created the Jordan brand subdivision. And in addition to this being the last Jordan to come in a Nike box, we see some new branding styles on the sneaker itself signifying this change. The loop of the heel tap sported a Jumpman logo and extended down the length of the heel, reading Jordan. And in smaller text, quality inspired by the greatest player ever. On top of the tongue flew a Jumpman logo and beneath it, it read TWO3 or 23. One final Jordan specific touch is a detailing above the midsole that read Jumpman. As for the technology of the shoe, the Jordan 12 carried an updated version of the carbon fiber heel shank that had been found in the Jordan 11. The 12 also contained a full zoom air unit, the first Jordan to ever have it. As with most Air Jordan models, an unforgettable moment in Michael Jordan's career infused itself into the identity of the Jordan 12. It was one colorway in particular that earned a unique title, the Flu Game 12s. During the 97 NBA playoffs, the Chicago Bulls and the Utah Jazz were tied 2-2, and on the day of the decisive Game 5, flu-like symptoms. Throughout the game, Mike was visibly staggering, dehydrated and exhausted, even having to be carried off the court once by teammate Scottie Pippen. But as we know, Michael rallied, scoring a total of 38 points and overtaking Utah in the game's final half minute. Though MJ and his coaches would later state that the illness had actually been caused by food poisoning, the black varsity red colorway that MJ had been rocking during the game would forever be known as the Flu Game 12s. In 2009, a Jordan 12 retro officially named the Flu Game 12s released. Same general colorway as the OG black varsity reds, but these had a stamp on the heel. 97 for the year followed by the Flu logo, and then a 38 for the number of points that Jordan scored in that game. Overall, it was another impressive award-winning season for Michael Jordan. He made his 11th All-Star Game appearance, won his 9th NBA scoring title, was first team All-NBA, first team All-Defense, and won NBA Finals MVP. The one missing accolade this year was the award for regular season MVP, which he narrowly lost to Karl Malone. However, this fueled Michael's fire to prove that he was the true MVP by outscoring Malone in the finals. And of course, Mike led the Bulls to their fifth championship win. Another fun fact about the Jordan 12 is that during the season in 1997, the 12 was so loved that Jordan's teammates were rocking them too. Bill Weddington and Luck Longley wore 12s on the court and even Scottie Pippen would rock them over his own signature shoe. Launching in 96 and 97 and selling for $135, the Jordan 12 saw five OG colorways, the Taxi 12s, the white Varsity Red 12s, the Obsidians, the Black Varsity, also known as the Flu Games, and the Playoff 12s. As is tradition here on this channel, we're gonna be taking a look at some of our favorite and some of your favorite Jordan 12 colorways. The Air Jordan 12 Wings is one of the dopest pairs if you ask me. Super classy gold detailing, a beautiful pattern showing through the translucent sole, but most importantly, the upper features black brush off leather that, over time, wears and reveals a pattern of gold wings underneath. In 2009, the Air Jordan 12 Rising Sun was released. Similar to the Jordan 11 model, it sported a patent leather mudguard instead of the standard reptile pattern leather of the 12, and the perforated sections of the stitched upper emulated more directly the actual Rising Sun flag. 
On launch, this version even had the rising sun flag on the insoles, but this proved to be controversial, and Nike delayed the release to replace the insoles. The Jordan 12 Retro Nubug is an interesting story. In 2003, Nike mailed out physical letters to members of Jumpman23.com, inviting them to visit a website where they'd be able to purchase a pack comprised of the Nubug 12s, a hat, and a hoodie. On release day, the sheer traffic of would-be buyers crashed the website, and it took days for Nike to sort out the issue and start selling the pack as intended. 2003 was definitely before my time, and I know there's some OG sneakerheads, and especially some OG uh, Jordan heads who, who remember this drop, and, and I'd love to hear your story if you guys were around when this happened. Leave it down in the comments below. As with many Air Jordan models, the 12 has found its way into the NFL. These Jordan 12 cleats have been worn on the field by Jordan brand signed NFL stars such as Des Bryant and Earl Thomas. As always, gotta mention the Dorenbecker. The 12's Dorenbecker Freestyle Black and Pink Blast was designed by the nine-year-old Carissa Navarro, a patient at Dorenbecker Children's Hospital who was born without kidneys. Carissa packed this custom design sneaker full of details as usual. This Dorenbecker needs a video of its own to really do it justice, as with most Dorenbecker Jordans. Or how about the Jordan 12 Low? I'm not sure how I feel about those. What do you guys feel about? Do I, I'm not. I'm just not a huge fan of any kind of Low Jordans, except for the ones and sometimes the 11. But what do you guys think? Check out this monochromatic PSNY Jordan 12s with the suede upper. Or how about the Gamma Blue Retro, one of the most popular Jordan 12s of all time? Finally, two colorways of the Air Jordan 12 OVO were released in 2016. Sporting branding from Drake's clothing brand, October's very own, also known as OVO. This was Drake's second big sneaker release with Nike since he was appointed a Jordan brand ambassador in 2014. The iridescent pearl effect on the mudguard is pretty dope if you ask me. It's Halloween in 1997 and the Chicago Bulls will face the Boston Celtics in the NBA season opener. Michael Jordan breaks out a pair of never before seen signature shoes. It's a white pair of kicks with a black midsole, toe box, black tongue, and some red accents. Unfortunately for the Bulls, they lost to the Celtics. But Jordan flexed in his new signature sneakers that night with a remarkable stat line of 30 points, six rebounds, and four assists. A month prior, the sneaker was unveiled to the press during an Air Jordan conference that not only debuted the new Jordan sneaker, but also the launch of Jordan brand as its own business entity. After signing an endorsement deal with Nike in 1984 and while becoming the greatest basketball player of all time, MJ had the most revered line of signature footwear in the world. Jordan's own brand was projected to yield more than 225 million in sales in the first year alone. The design of the Air Jordan 13 once again fell into the hands of the GOAT sneaker designer we all know and love, Mr. Tinker Hatfield. While watching the Chicago Bulls on TV, Tinker Hatfield saw Michael Jordan through a different lens. On the court, the chiseled 6'6 shooting guard was smart and fast. He was powerful and instinctive. He could conserve his energy like no other on the basketball court, and at the right time and right moment, he'd attack his prey like a panther, a black cat. Tinker wasted no time getting to work on a design sketch for the sneaker. The first sketch of the 13 is dated September 11th, 1995, and it only includes two small drawings of the sneaker, as most of the space on the page is taken up by Tinker's notes. The notes are actually pretty hilarious, and I'm gonna read some of them out loud right now. It says, uh, Warner Brothers movie. I think they might have been thinking about putting this shoe in Space Jam, maybe, because this was designed in 95. Better shape than ever. Uh, proliferation of wild shoe designs. Fila copies of number 11. So I guess it's a swipe at Fila. Uh, B-Ball needs a classy spokesperson wearing a classy shoe instead of a crazy shoe. On the left, you'll see it says simple pattern, designed to fit, engineered to perform, and designed for basketball elegance. It's super cool. I, I urge you guys to just Google uh, Jordan 13 Tinker Hatfield sketches and look at these. It's amazing to see. Once he developed the black cat or panther concept, Tinker employed it throughout the entire structure of the design. While taking into account the point at which Jordan was in his career and the elements he needed in a shoe to reinforce his reign. Out of retirement, 
Jordan won back-to-back -back championships in 1996 and 97, and he was hungry for that second three-peat of his career. The other teams knew this and defended him harder than ever before. Jordan took beatings every night, but preserving his speed and physicality was crucial if he wanted to win another championship. Here's the original presentation board that Tinker showed to Michael Jordan back in 1996. When he saw the board and heard me mention the words Black Cat, he stopped me. He just stopped me dead and said, how did you know? I'm like, how did I know what? He goes, how do you know what my secret nickname is? It's only used by best friends. I said, I didn't know anybody ever called you the black cat. If you look at the original sketches of the outsole of the Jordan 13, you will see that it is directly inspired by the paws of a panther, a feature that would carry over into the official release. One feature that didn't was the addition of a strap. Tinker added the strap for more stability, but Michael Jordan felt like it didn't need to be there and they decided against it. Another fun fact about the Jordan 13 is that it was the first ever Jordan design on a computer. The first sneaker ever designed on a computer in the industry actually. The sneaker featured a zoom air unit at the forefoot and the heel making it super comfortable on and off the court. The upper features some synthetic suede right before running into a huge piece of reflective mesh that pays tribute to the flecks of color in the fur of a black panther. By far the most iconic feature on the shoe is the holographic cat eye bubble that you see near the heel area. The green holographic cat eye is iconic for two main reasons. One is that it's a sign of the times. And what I mean by that is, think of the awesome 90s holographic Marvel cards. It brings me great nostalgia because I just remember this being the ultimate aesthetic as a kid in the 90s. And secondly, the fact that Tinker Hatfield had the genius to incorporate this into the design as a direct inspiration of the eye of a panther is just next level, man. That's gotta be the coolest thing I've ever seen on a basketball shoe, is that holographic cat eye. Let me know what you think in the comments down below, and if you're enjoying this video, why not give it a like? The Air Jordan 13 was used in the Spike Lee movie, He Got Game, which featured a young Ray Allen and Denzel Washington. Everyone knows Spike Lee has a long-standing relationship with Air Jordan, so the product placement in the film was natural and perfectly executed. The film came out months after the official release of the Jordan 13, but it still added to the excitement for the new Air Jordan sneaker. Michael Jordan is CEO Jordan. From 1997 to 1998, Jordan Brand released a total of seven colorways. The Black Toes, also referred to as the He Got Games because of the film, the Chicago 13s, the Flints, which are my personal favorite, the Playoff 13s, which feature a mostly black upper with red accents. These make the cat eye pop out even more in my opinion. The Bread 13s, and finally two Jordan Lows, one in a navy metallic colorway and the other the Jordan 13 Chutney Low. Those are fire. Now, there are a ton of non-OG Jordan 13 colorways that are worth mentioning, but I'm not gonna go through every single one because that would take forever and you'd probably get bored. But here are some honorable mentions. The Altitude 13s, which feature a slime green outsole. The Kwai 54 Lows, which I actually happen to love. The Premio Bin 23 Jordan 13s, which gave the Jordan 13s a luxurious feel. And of course, the Black Cat 13s. Oh, and we can't leave out the inevitable Ray Allen PE 13s. He was one of the first athletes officially endorsed by Jordan Brand, and he was also featured in the He Got Game film after all, so it made sense for them to, to give him a PE. For much of the 97-98 season, MJ would rock the Jordan 13, and he won the 1996 championship wearing the Jordan 11s, and then in 1997, he won again in a pair of Jordan 12s. So it would only make sense that he would win his sixth and final championship in a pair of 13s, right? Well, not quite. You see, the Air Jordan 13 didn't have a signature on-court moment like the flu game 12s or the Jordan 3 when he dunked from the free throw line, or how about the clutch shot tied to the Jordan 4s? The Jordan 13 never had something like that. And by the time the 98 finals had started, Tinker had already finished the Air Jordan 14, which MJ wore in the NBA finals against the Utah Jazz in rotation with the Jordan 13. However, only one sneaker was remembered from that final series, and that was the Air Jordan 14, in which Michael Jordan took the final shot of his career with the Chicago Bulls, earning him his sixth and final championship victory. Michael Jordan has never lost an NBA final series in his career. 
let alone has never let a series go to a game seven. For people that don't know basketball, the NBA Finals is the championship series. Each time the opportunity presented itself, MJ and his crew delivered. So why would we even doubt him in 1998 when he had the ball in his hands, seconds to go and down one point? With everything on the line, not to mention his sixth championship victory and a potential three-peat for the Bulls, MJ fearlessly pulls up to his defender with a quick step back, or if you're a hardcore Jazz fan, a push off, and proceeds to drain his final shot as a member of the Chicago Bulls. A shot that defined Michael Jordan's career and set the bar so high, anything that has happened ever since is irrelevant when compared to his career. Naturally, this iconic sports moment also has an iconic sneaker tied to it. The shoes MJ had on feet when making his final shot with the Bulls, the Air Jordan 14. It's no secret that Michael Jordan has an affinity for the finer things in life. Cigars, golf, and sports cars. And when it came time for the famed Jordan brand designer Tinker Hatfield to conjure up something new for the Jordan 14, he took MJ's love of sports cars and morphed it into a high-tech basketball shoe. This is something Tinker Hatfield is a genius at, taking cues from the subtleties of Michael Jordan's game and life and then turning them into functioning pieces of art, or as we sneaker enthusiasts like to call it, making fire. For example, let's take a look at the previous Air Jordan silhouette, the Jordan 13. This sneaker was inspired by Michael Jordan's nickname, given to him by his inner circle, the Black Cat. Hence why the sneaker mimics a panther's paw on the outsole and has a cat eye woven into it. If you want to know more about the Jordan 13, we actually have a whole history video on it and stick around to the end and I will link it so you can check it out after this video. The Air Jordan 14 was inspired by a couple Ferrari models, the Ferrari 355 F1 and the Ferrari 550 Maranello, both of which Michael Jordan owned at one point. The midsole was modeled after the grille on the 550 while the outsole was clearly a nod to the Pirelli tires which gave the sneaker an aggressive look. If you look at the back of the shoe, you can see the large 24 that goes down the back of it in the shape of an engine piston. The most standout and obvious connection to Italian sports cards though is the Jumpman crest which mimics the Ferrari's iconic logo. As for the technology in the shoe, the Jordan 14 is considered one of the most comfortable Jordan silhouettes of all time, with zoom air units in both the heel and the forefoot along with a Phylon midsole and grippy herringbone pattern on the outsole. The shoe also features a unique exhaust system characterized by a ventilation hole on each shoe's medial midsole to allow air in and out to help cool your foot. Fun fact, Derek Jeter actually wore a custom baseball cleat of the Air Jordan 14 back in 1999. The Air Jordan 14 debuted in eight original colorways, an odd number of OG colorways by today's standard, but that's one of the charms that makes the 14 unique. Out of the eight OG colorways, there were a total of five high top versions and three low renditions. The first to release was the Black Toe in 1998, followed by the Varsity Red in 1999, while the oxidized green pair didn't hit until February. The legendary Last Shot iteration was released on March 27th with the Indiglo following suit. The lows came later in 1999 with a Royal, Columbia, and Ginger colorway. Man, they need to hurry up and retro the Gingers because those are my favorite 14s of all time. Also, do you guys call them Royal Lows or Laney Lows? Let me know in the comments down below. When the shoe was released in the late 90s, gang violence was at an all time high. And in the city of Salinas, California, law enforcement officials were concerned about the release of the sneaker because of the Roman numeral design details. They even wrote a letter to Nike about it. The Roman numeral for 14 spells out XIV, which is a symbol for gangs like Norteños who would often tag the Roman numeral in their barrios and get it tattooed on them. If you count up the alphabet in order, the 14th letter is the letter N. Not to mention, the Jordan 14 also featured the gang's color, red. Check out this clip from a news channel in Salinas from the 1990s. Could Nike's new Air Jordan basketball shoes spark deadly gang violence? That's what Bay Area police and authorities in surrounding areas fear, and now they're trying to prevent it. Tony Russomano explains from Salinas. Police in San Jose and several other Northern California cities say they are intensely interested in Nike's latest Air Jordan basketball shoes. What got their attention was a letter to Nike from the mayor of Salinas warning that the shoes could lead to violence. The police interest is not in who's wearing them necessarily, but in what it means when they do. Our biggest concern is that a nationally 
distributed product by a internationally known corporate name would be used to further promote the uh, ideologies of a criminal organization. That organization would be Northern California's Norteno Street Gang. And Michael pulls up and buries the shot to give him a one-point lead. The shoes are the 14th edition of basketball superstar Michael Jordan's wildly popular line. So they carry the number 14 in Roman numerals in a red circle on the sole. The color and the numerals XIV are used by Norteno gang members to identify themselves. The letter N is the 14th letter of the alphabet. And gang members mark their territory with their symbols. You can imagine seeing them walking through uh, dirt alleys or something, leaving little XIVs all over the floor, you know. Gang outreach workers say even non-gang members who unknowingly display a gang symbol in a rival's territory have been shot and stabbed. The shoes cost $150 a pair. You might think that price would put off a lot of potential buyers, but Salinas police say local stores have sold out of their first two shipments and won't even be getting any more in until March. Nike says they have no intention to stop selling them. But the company is taking out newspaper ads in Salinas and Chico this weekend to emphasize what a spokeswoman calls the company's and Michael Jordan's values. The solution is helping build strong communities and helping build strong programs. And, and that's where we choose to, to focus our efforts on in, in addressing this issue. That truly is the answer. Police say it would be futile to try to prevent sale of the shoes. Instead, they want parents to be aware of what their kids are wearing and why they're wearing it. In Salinas, Tony Russomano, Channel 5 Eyewitness News. All right, there are a ton of sought after non OG Jordan 14 colorways, so let's go over some of the more important ones and some of our favorites. Let's start with the most rare Jordan 14, the mid UNC East Bay exclusive. Allegedly, Jordan brand made these for the UNC basketball team and Jordan overproduced them, so the remaining batch was packaged as an East Bay exclusive and now they go for thousands of dollars. It's a beautiful colorway, in my opinion. There was the forest green joints, the chartreuse, cinder 14s, and the amazing light graphite colorway, which I personally love. All right, here's one for the OGs in the community. It's the Air Jordan 14 from the Countdown pack, which puts the Jordan's 14 ribbed stitching design on full display. The last ones I'll throw in here are the Ferrari 14s, which feature a beautiful seamless design, like literally seamless. As you can see from the upper, there are no stitches. Not that long ago, they did a reverse version of this colorway. It's called the Reverse Ferrari, and it features a gold upper instead of red. After all these years, the Jordan 14 is still getting plenty of love thanks to collaborators like Klot and Alele May. The Air Jordan 14 in Klot Terracotta is inspired by the tomb of China's first emperor, who was buried surrounded by an army of 8,000 sculptured soldiers to protect him in the afterlife. The tomb was unearthed in the early 70s and the reddish clay 8000 figurines are now known as the Terracotta Army. As for the Alele May Jordan 14, the shoe is inspired by her early memories of the jewelry she saw growing up in her household, which happened to be the color Jade. The color Jade has a long history for meaning good luck and so the name for the collab is appropriately named the Jordan 14 Fortune. It's a beautiful take on a luxurious silhouette. 